Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Xiao. And some of you may know a lot of my research has to do with self-disclosure. So today, I'm going to present another one of my projects on self-disclosure. And speaking of self-disclosure, I actually have something kind of embarrassing to admit. So when I was a teenager, I used to be a big fan of the show Gossip Girl. Um, and for those of you who are actually fortunate enough not to know what the show is, it's a TV drama about a bunch of high schoolers in New York. And in one of my favorite episodes, Blair, this girl here, decided to host a masquerade ball and invited all her friends to come. It was kind of amazing just to see you know, how people dress up and put on masks. And it's even more amazing to see how people behave so differently when they are behind a mask. I mean, these people are friends of each other, but Masquerade Ball provided an opportunity for them to be anonymous with friends. And that has certain benefits and risks that we will be discussing today. So fast forward to 2014. I started grad school, and I decided to put Gossip Girl away behind me. However, the only problem was that my advisor, who's not here, put me on a secret project. I mean that quite literally, a secret project. So secret was an anonymous social application that was founded in 2013, gained significant popularity in 2014, and eventually shut down in 2015. When it first launched, Secret looked slightly different. And it was branded as an application where you can anonymously share with your friends. Sounds familiar? It's just like a masquerade ball from Gossip Girl, only this is not on your phone. So I guess the takeaway is one never really puts Gossip Girl away behind her, even in grad school. So on Secret, a user can, uh, can invite friends to join the app and can post and comment anonymously in a feed. All posts appear in a stream, similar of, that of Twitter, but there is no username, so you cannot identify even the same user across different platforms, uh, across different posts, sorry. Now you may be thinking, Secret no longer exists. Why are we here talking about an app that has been gone for two years? Well, the situation here kind of reminds me of a little book cover I saw the other day. <laughs> I think I actually have an animation here. <laughs> so yes, anyways, believe it or not, this is actually a key figure in this presentation. We care about Secret because it represents a family of anonymous social applications, most notably Yikyak and Whisper. Over the course of past four years, they collectively gained a lot of popularity as well as a lot of backlashing and seem to be on decline as we speak. On the one hand, these anonymous social applications promise users to be yourself, to find your herd. Whoa. What's going on? Start again. Speaking of dinosaurs. Okay, here we go. On the one hand, these anonymous social applications promise users to be yourself, to find your herd, and to express yourself openly and honestly. On the other hand, they have been criticized for having a dark side, for facilitating bullying, and therefore should be banned. So the goal here today is really to present both opportunities and challenges that anonymous social applications face. By presenting findings from a qualitative study on Secret, these apps come and go, but the fundamental social factors seem to be consistent in the evolution of anonymous social applications. This is a quote in the title of our paper, people are either too fake or too real. We, have, we will see in just a second what this means. But for now, let's just go ahead and take a look at the plan of the rest of the talk. So I'm going to first de uh, define two categories of anonymous social applications, tie-based and location-based. 
Then I will talk about methods and of this specific study and highlight four sub-themes of our findings. I'll close with the discussion on opportunities and challenges and some comments on where we think anonymous social applications may be heading in the future. So first thing first, I want to make it very clear that although both secret and ICAC anonymous social applications, they are quite different animals. I mean, one is a fox and the other is a Himalaya yak. <laughs> But in all seriousness, what I mean is that these two applications differ in audience. On Secret, the audience is one's social ties. While on ICAC, the audience is people nearby and can be total strangers. In a previous study presented at Kai last year, we showed that um, people's willingness to self-disclose differ based on these two types of audience, even when they are anonymous. Therefore, we decided to treat these two types of anonymity differently and separate them into tie-based versus location-based. Here is a summary of some of the previous studies on anonymous social applications in the past three years. These are great work. We love these people. Uh, and in this work, we add to the literature by fo focusing on the behavior of users in tie-based anonymity services, which we believe is best addressed using a qualitative approach. I should note here that Whisper is partially location-based and some applications do not fit neatly into such categorizations, especially be because these startups tend to revamp all the time. We ask three research questions. First, what types of interactions do tie-based anonymities afford? Second, what benefits do users experience? And third, what drawbacks do users perceive in tie-based anonymity? In terms of method, we used a pretty standard semi-structured interview. In particular, we recruited users from two platforms and there were two rounds of interviews. At the time of our study, 2014, Secret had a Chinese equivalent named Mimi, meaning Secret in Chinese. Two apps were almost identical in functionality, so we recruited participants from both participants for comprehensiveness. We watched out closely for any possible cultural difference in analysis, but did not find any significant ones. So we pulled the data together in analysis as well as reporting the results going forward. During the course of our study, Secret changed the application design significantly and switched from a type-based model to a location-based model, similar to that of ICAC. So we followed up with Secret users seven months later after the first wave of the interview. Obviously, we have a set of very interesting results. And for brevity, I'm going to highlight four out of the six themes here. You can, of course, always refer to our paper for full details. First, compared to real name social platforms, we found that, for the most part, participants felt there is a reduced need for identity management on Secret, but not completely, depending on the situation. One participant thinks her friends can recognize her from her speech patterns, and she said, when I'm feeling depressed, I don't want people to know who I am, so I intentionally hide my speech habits. But for other types, I don't really care, so I don't change anything in particular. Second, one of the most fascinating things about tie-based anonymity is denonymization. We found that people were not too concerned about what we call hard hacking, meaning the technical ways of exposing one's identity. But participants were well aware of and also frequently engaged in different kinds of soft hacking, social maneuvers that try to figure out who the original poster is. For example, one would delete someone in their contact list to see if a post disappears, or they would share screenshots with their friends in order to compare and triangulate who their common friends are and narrow down on the identity of the original poster. Third, Despite the possibility of being recognized, Secret provides a lot of benefits that anonymity is known to provide. Participants report posting more intimate content on Secret, and they generally recognize that benefit of being able to let it out, especially for something that they cannot post on real name social media platforms or talk in face-to-face -face situations. In addition, the majority of the participants report gaining or providing support on the platform. For example, one participant talked about a difficult health situation she was experiencing, and she reported receiving support from her friends. In her own words, she said, 
I think most of them were friends, and they said something encouraging along the lines of it's important for your health, and I'm really sorry that it all happened. We are here for you if you reach out to someone to go with you. Being able to talk with friends anonymously can also provide the benefit of learning something new about one's friends that is not available from real name channels, leading to increased social awareness. For example, this participant reported gaining a better understanding of the sexuality of his friends. He said, I had no idea that some of my friends are uh, question their sexual orientation and they are afraid to talk about it in person but they are okay with talking about it in sort of this anonymous aspect. So I think it's great for me to understand my group of friends better as a whole, and maybe next time when I'm in a social gathering, I won't make any comments about people's sexual orientation or something like that. Finally, as expected and in line with lots of previous research on anonymity, our participants reported observing negativity on secret. Although participants did not admit to bullying or contributing to conflicts, some confessed commenting in an impulsive way, saying things they did not really mean. One participant summarized the negativity on the platform, saying that it's like a train wreck. It's a disaster when you look because you just can't believe people are this terrible. So on that negative note, let's move into the discussion. So we have seen that Thai-based anonymity can benefit users by allowing them to have a more open conversation with friends. The act of self-disclosure is known to have important psychological benefits. This is the first opportunity of Thai-based anonymity. The second opportunity is that being able to self-disclose anonymously with, with friends extends social behavior that is not available through real name platforms. Users can engage in social probing and test the waters with friends, especially for something that they feel hard to talk about openly under real names. This can lead to positive outcomes such as increased social awareness and, get, get, uh, and gaining or providing social support from friends without compromising one's identity. Thirdly, we also say that, uh, see that not having a consistent username across different posts allows for anonymity at will. Some participants engage in what we call identity stenography. The term comes from social stenography, a practice of hiding secret uh, in plain sight so that unwanted parties cannot find or understand what it, what it means. With Thai-based anonymity, people can craft messages in a way that only certain audience can, with contextual knowledge can figure out who they really are and therefore reach out privately um, to them. On the other hand, there are also plenty of challenges, including negativity and bullying, rumors and gossip, as well as the need for critical mass for Thai-based anonymity to function. You can't really be anonymous with only two friends on the platform. It would be, to, be too easy to figure out who posted what. So where is this all going? We talked about the shutdown secret, and if you have been following the news, Yikuk and Whisper are not doing so great either. Um, and as I worked on my presentation last night, I checked the news. Yikak is confirmed to shut down. Such is the nature of real-world applications. They come and go, and new ones keep popping up um, and replacing the old ones. We have done research on Thai-based anonymity. Is it possible that other modes of anonymity would continue to exist? For example, a number of anonymous applications continue to evolve like Blind, a company-based anonymity, where people are identified by the company they work for, and others such as Kick and Seven Cups. But we also believe that there is room for Thai-based anonymity to make a comeback in different format. We provide a few design implications on this front in the paper. For example, integrating anonymity flashes into real name platforms such as Facebook, as well as different ways of curbing negativity, such as making someone gra gradually lose anonymity if their content has been flagged multiple times. Finally, I promise that I will explain what this quote means. People are either too fake or too real. Anonymous social applications allow people to have a more open conversation with target audiences. People can be too fake by spreading rumors and gossips and saying things they don't really mean. But people can also be too real, saying whatever is on their mind, uncurbed, and therefore end up hurting or being hurt by other people. 
This is the gene of the anonymous social application that was carried from a fox to a Himalaya yuck and now to a blind. We're excited as well as terrified, and, but we look forward to future evolutions of different anonymity models to unfold. Now, enough about anonymity. I'd like to de-anonymize all my collaborators, Nas at Drexel, Louise at ITU, and my advisor, Mo at Cornell Tech. This research is supported by ALL through the Connected Experience Lab. I also like to acknowledge the contributions of Roz and Funda, who are now at Facebook. That's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoy my talk and look forward to your questions.